It is April 28, 2011, and Lindy Heim and I, Charles Thompson, are here visiting with Walter Walker, the Plymouth Historical Society, hoping to be able to learn from Walter some of the important things of our past that we don't know about. Could you tell us a little about your parents, who they were, what their names are, were, and uh, where they were born? My mother is a, a woman girl, and that's the reason I spent so much time here. My father had connections with Wilma in that his ancestors were Langley's, but they were far enough back so that uh, I used to tease my father about uh, marrying his own relatives, but it was a very distant cousin. My mother was a very distant cousin of my father's. My father lived on the farm where his father lived and his grandfather lived and his great-grandfather lived in where my son lives right now. My son, Rusty, who lives there now, is the sixth generation of walkers to live on that farm. And my grandmother, Langley, my mother's mother, who is an old, old woman girl, her parents lived on Cross Hill, a house that was supposedly going to be restored and the carpenter who was going to do it was a little slow and by the time he got around to really doing anything it was beyond saving so it eventually just fell down and there's nothing there now to show where the lane was started. A lot of Stearns and Aries uh, spent a lot of time in women when they were young uh, Stuart Bradley used to come up all home days uh, from down south, and he spent a lot of time here in Wilmot when he was a boy. Uh, he would come up and spend weeks and weeks with his cousins at the Langley's, as with others. So they all grew up together, and... Uh, there were, it seemed like there were a connection with, with everybody. Uh, so you had to be careful what you said, because if you didn't, you'd often find out you were talking about a relative. What did they do for work? What were their occupations? My father? Yes. Uh, he was, a, a, well, he was, I think of myself as being a skilled person, and, and I am in a respect, but I, I, can't, I can't touch a, a candle to what he did. He was a self-taught man in a lot of ways. He went to Proctor for one year, and then he got sick of school and quit. But he seemed and made his own skis as a teenager. He was a self-taught blacksmith. Uh, he was an excellent carpenter, uh, Maud Smith. When I met her once at a benefit in uh, the library, remembered my father's stairs that he built for her, and she said she would never forget those beautiful, beautiful stairs that Frank Walker built. But uh, he uh, contacted a rare disease uh, <clears throat> right in the uh, prime of his life called transverse myelitis that was uh, much, much worse than polio, and it... Uh, paralyzed him from the waist down, and a lot of people died from the disease, but he fought back and eventually learned to walk and felt that he couldn't do carpenter work again. So he uh, raised poultry, and during the Second World War, uh, a man could make a very good living at that, and we kids, of course, were getting old enough, so, so we chipped in and helped on all of this. And uh, that was how he, he raised money enough to, to uh, send away kids to high school and stuff like that. And then eventually, of course, the poultry business in the Midwest boomed and, and there was no, no income here in, in New England for poultry farmers and he, he gave it up. But he was an excellent captain and a painter and a, and a mason and uh, you name it, he could do it. Do you have brothers or sisters? Yes. Uh, I have a sister who's still alive. She lives in Laconia, and uh, she has a, a daughter and a son. Her daughter is in California, and her son lives 
nearby in Laconia, and my brother, who was five years younger than I, uh, Danny, uh, used to live in Andover, and he was unfortunate with the women he married, and now he lives in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, has built himself a new home up there, and uh, my sister sees him once in a while, but uh, he comes down this way very, very seldom. But again, he he was very handy. He inherited my father's skills. He was my brother is an excellent carpenter, and in some ways he's more clever than I am. I've seen some of the things he did. He has a lot of original ideas which I don't have, and uh, again, he could do a lot of plumbing and masonry work. Uh, same as my father, but but he wasn't a blacksmith or, or things like that, like my dad was. What do you remember about growing up with your brother and sister? We were lucky. Uh, we were we grew up during the Depression, which everybody's heard of, but my grandfather was still alive and in good health then, so uh, we had a, a small, my grandfather rather, had a, a typical small farm with a pair of oxen, <clears throat> a couple of, of cattle, a pig, uh, some some uh, poultry, uh, a turkey or two, uh, maybe a few ducks. And so uh, we, we were very well off food-wise. Uh, we had no money, and so we, we never saw the dentist or a doctor unless it was really a... a major catastrophe, uh, but uh, there was a brook nearby, and during the summers we, we had an awful lot of fun uh, swimming in that brook, and, and the fishing in that brook. Uh, before the Second World War, it was incredible. You could go out anywhere. In fact, that's one of the earliest memories I have of my grandfather. Uh, I found his fly rod and I found some worms, and I went out, and the fish would bite, but I didn't know enough to give a jerk and set the hook, and of course the fish would just let go when I pulled. So my grandfather, I went in crying because I couldn't catch any fish. So my grandfather came out and showed me how to set the hook. So then we had a lot of fish for breakfast. But uh, then uh, it was like that until the end of the Second World War, and then people had time, and they learned about the beautiful, beautiful fishing in that brook, and no time at all, the good fishing was gone, and the only time there was good fishing then, and now, is after it's stocked for the state of New Hampshire, and it doesn't last very long. But uh, we, were, we were very lucky in that my grandfather was able to do these things. If he hadn't been there, uh, I don't know how we would have made it uh, with, with my father in bed, uh, suffering so much pain. He, he begged his mother to shoot him, uh, but uh, naturally she didn't, and eventually uh, he, uh, he fought his way back. But it was, uh, it was a rough life for, for all of us, mostly, my mother, because she had to take care of my father, she was teaching school in a one one room schoolhouse in North Loma at the same time, and taking care of us kids. So uh, she had one hell of a burden. I don't know how she ever did it. Was there anything you did in your childhood that stands out as a particularly happy time? It always seemed to me that there would be. Uh, two happy things, then a bad thing. My father had brought home a, a collie puppy, and uh, it was an awful nice dog, and we had an awful lot of fun with it. And we were doing something one day, playing with it, and it accidentally ran out into the road, and I think it was Novin, Davin, boy, it doesn't matter, somebody had struck it. It was an accident, it couldn't be helped. And so that was, that was a happy time punctured by a very, very sad time. It always seemed to me that happened in my life. I'd have two nice things and then a bad thing. But uh, that was an early happy time. In grade school, uh, of course, we, we all worked during the Second World War 
collecting a lot of scrap metal and things like that. And uh, also another thing that we collected, and, and people uh, sometimes wondered about that, but we collected milkweed pots, and they used those to make life vests for saving people that were uh, on ships with torpedo and that sort of thing. That was one thing we did. We collected scrap iron. We had a great big pile of scrap iron at school, and Audrey Kerr and Frosty took a picture of us all on top of this big pile of scrap iron before they came and picked it up and, and took it for the war effort. So there were a lot of happy times at school, too. Uh, one time that stands out in my memory was uh, we had a beautiful crust, and there was a, a field in front of the, the whole place, which was next to the one-room schoolhouse in South Danbury. And we had this beautiful, beautiful crust. And so it was so good that Audrey Curran came out after lunch and joined us, and we stayed out beyond the hour, the total hour that we were allowed at noontime sliding. And then when we came back, lo and behold, there was a superintendent who had come to visit school. And poor Audrey, of course, was embarrassed. So but, she, but the superintendent calmed her right down and said, if I was a few years younger, I would have been out there with you. So that was that was a happy time on, on the, the crest. Uh, we used to make little dams on the hillside. Uh, with the water in the springtime, and uh, do a lot of a lot of happy times there in the, the one room schoolhouse. Did you go through all eight eight years there? Yes, yeah, we went to eight grades, and uh, it was a little strange because <clears throat> I was held back one year. Uh, it was a, a a mile and a half walk to school, and in the summertime. Spring and fall was fine, but in the winter time, when the wind was blowing, it was down below zero. That mile and a half seemed like five miles. It was, it was torture. I I remember both my sister and I crying when we got home. We were suffering so from the cold because we just did not have the the uh, stuff that they have today, the uh, ski equipment, the uh, the downs, and all that stuff to keep us warm. So we. We had some frostbite. I have a, an ear that's a little strange today from the frostbite. So I was held back a year. So I was actually sort of a year behind everybody else because of that. And where did you go to high school? Uh, I went to high school in, in Andover, which, uh, of course, now has no high school. Uh, to where I was there, I graduated in 49. Uh, it was... It was a girls' school long before it was a boys' or girls' high school. Uh, the boys went to Proctor and the girls went to Andover. Then, I think it was around 32 or somewhere along there that it was changed. So both boys and girls went to Andover. And then uh, it was 60... 60 sometime was it that uh, the last class graduated from Andover and uh, it was turned into a, a middle school now and there's no, no end of a high school anymore but we have reunions and uh, a lot of people come from sometimes they even come from Florida to attend our high school reunions and we're very fortunate that the odd ways to open their uh, field where they have it set up for activities. Uh, I have a small pond, and uh, they throw that open for the end of high school reunions, and it, it works out really great. So we get to meet our old classmates, and some that were before us, and some that were behind us. How did you get to high school? 
we were very lucky. There was a train that went down at the right time in the morning and a train that came back at the right time in, in the afternoon. And we got a, a student's ticket for about a third or a quarter the price of a normal ticket. And I think we got one for one or two weeks and the conductor would punch it just like a regular ticket. So that was great for at least one year and maybe a year and a half. And then they started doing away with some of the trains and they substituted a bus. And so that was okay. And then eventually they even did away with the bus. So so it got to be very difficult to get to school. And about that time, <clears throat> I turned 16 and was able to get my driver's license, which was a little bit different in those days too. Uh, I went up with my father, with my folks car to Danbury, where an old farmer uh, was giving the test for a driver's license. So we went in, and I had a written test to begin with, and he handed it to me, and he said, if you have any trouble with that, he said, just let me know. He said, I'll help you. So I, I didn't have to ask him for help, and I guess I, I did it okay because he looked it over and said, yeah, that's all right. He said, you you made one mistake here. He said, but that, that you still will pass. So... Then he said, we'll, uh, we'll go, for a drive, go for a ride. So my father had said to him, uh, he's been driving at home for the last, uh, what do you say, uh, last three or four years on the farm. Of course, my father said, well, actually, I was driving off the farm some, but he didn't mention that. Anyway, uh, we drove, oh, probably... 500 feet or something other then turned around and, and drove back and and he gave me my driver's license that's that's how you got your driver's license back in those days if you could if you could see him then your eyes were good enough and if you could drive down the road and back and without saving up the car then you passed it was so different so different back in those days what year were you married <laughs> Don't embarrass me, Charlie. All right, how many years have you been married? <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> uh, I got out in 54. I met her in 55. We were married in, we were married in 55. You mentioned you, your children earlier. Who, who are your children, and uh, where are they now? Again, uh, we are very lucky. We have four healthy children, and they all live in the area. Our oldest son, Wade, father. My career, he's a captain now. He works for a local contractor. The next oldest son, his real name is Daniel. We all call him Rusty, and he's the one that still lives on the farm in South Dam before I grew up. The sixth generation to be there. He's uh, into professional commercial cleaning. The third child is our daughter, Holly. She's a professional woman. She uh, owns and, and runs Compass Travel. You know one that she married an Italian, Luigi Minoletti, and uh, they have no children. And my youngest son, Nathan, who was a natural mechanic, and I could see that when he was a teenager. But I am surprised that he turned out to be an excellent businessman. He has his, his own garage down here in Wilbur Flat, and he's a very successful businessman. And without him, I'd be lost whenever I everything go wrong with any of my uh, mechanical stuff, and I can always call on him. And, he almost always can bail me out. We've had a great uh, a great chat here. I've enjoyed this. Is there anything else you can think of you'd like to add that I haven't have out? Uh, when I was fouled up with my with my second back surgery, the people around here, uh, not only around Rome, but New on Ava, were so good to me. Uh, they collected money twice, twice they collected money for me. Uh, Judy would go to what was in Crescentis in London uh, for food and stuff, and they would say, uh, your bill's already paid. Uh, she'd go in to pay the oil bill, and Kitty would say, your bill's already paid. Uh, we never knew. You know, we did those things, but uh, people were so good to us. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a great note to end on. Uh, Walter, thank you very much. This has been terrific.